Hi, Yasmina. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so as Yasmina said, I'm Mark Garrett. I'm CEO of Intridia, and this is Fitter Happier. We are going to look at uh, how you can improve your team's health and productivity using some open source software, including Rails and R, and uh, including a little tool called Fitbit. Um, let's talk about uh, some of the things that we're going to discuss today, but, but also what, what we're not going to do today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, a lot of the attendees manage a team, and ideally an engineering team. Um, I'm also hopeful that many of the attendees are coders, but uh, while we're going to show you some code, you don't really need to be a stats expert or an R expert to follow along. Uh, we're also going to be helping you ask the right questions in terms of managing your team and helping them be more productive. Now, I'm not going to bar you, bore you with too many charts about exactly how uh, the team at Intridia works because that's not so useful. So the goal is to point you in the right direction. Now, I'd like to do um, three things today. I have three objectives. The first thing is I want to convince you that it's beneficial to examine how your team functions, to look at its circadian rhythms, when it works, how it recharges. The second thing I want to do, and, and maybe this is the most important, is I want to show you how easy it is to get started and finally, the last thing I want to do is I want to leave this talk with questions forming in your head about how you can work better and improve the well-being and productivity of your own team. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Yasmina. So uh, I, I had some personal motivation to get fitter and happier. Uh, if you can see the slide uh, that uh, Mark version 1.0 was about 80 pounds heavier than Mark version 2.0. And there's, um, there's, there's a particular reason for that. Next slide, please, Jasmina. The company that I work for called Intridia uh, has a lot of fantastic clients, Amazon.com, Bloomberg, Pew Research Center, and we build web and mobile applications. And uh, we find that one of our competitive advantages in hiring employees is that the fact that even though we have a headquarters in Washington, D.C., every single Intridian gets to work from home. And uh, that makes uh, for very high uh, workplace happiness. But it also means that um, if you're simply rolling to the fridge for lunch and breakfast, uh, you might put on, uh, I think what we politely call the freshman 15. For some people, it was the freshman 20. For me, it was maybe the freshman 80. But, uh, but we do find that, um, that uh, we, we need to find ways to be healthy while we're being productive at work. Now, uh, we first started to look uh, next slide, please, Yasmina. We first started to look basically at how our team works and how they take advantage from working at home with a, a platform called Your Time. Uh, if you'd like to check it out on the web, you can look at it live. It's called yourtime.entridia.com. And we did a couple things. We asked every Intridian to tell us how far they would have to commute uh, if they were to drive into work, basically the, the average number of miles that they, uh, that they save every day. And we tallied that with all the Intridians, um, both uh, commute time and, and on a mileage basis. And we found collectively that we save about 9,800 hours every single year out of our lives by not sitting in a car or by not sitting on the subway. We also asked Intridians what they do at that time. Next slide, please, Yasmina. And we found some great stories. So for example, we found that Ben, one of our designers, got to see uh, the very first uh, steps that his son took. Uh, and he got to be at home the day his daughter went off to her first dance class. Uh, so we, we found that really there's a great quality of life in terms of getting to work from home. But again, we had that nagging problem with the, the freshman 20. Next slide, please, Yasmina. So what we did uh, was we got Fitbits for everybody. And if you haven't heard of a Fitbit, a Fitbit is simply a little dongle that you clip on your clothing or to your hip, and it measures your steps. Uh, there are all sorts of competitors out there. We don't have any sort of financial relationship with Fitbit. So you could do the same thing with a, a Nike product or, or any number of products, but we got Fitbits because they seem to be durable, they're affordable, and most importantly, they had an API. Uh, so again, it tracks your steps, it tracks activity. Uh, it has a website where you can track things like calories, and next slide, please, Yasmina. It also has a community leaderboard. 
so one of the first things we did before we even started measuring the data, and yes, Mina, I should say I, I can't actually see the slides that you're on, but I'm assuming that you're able to show the, the leaderboard now. Um, We're showing that right now. That, perfect, thank you. Uh, so uh, the first thing we did before we even started tracking data was just have everybody hook themselves up to Fitbit, and we found right away that the, the competitive challenge that uh, you see by kind of stepping and racing against your peers all drove us right away to more activity before we even started pulling the data. But then also, we're, we're hackers, so we got curious, and we applied for a Fitbit Partner API key. Now, a lot of what we'll be talking about today will be pulling data from APIs, application programmer interfaces, if, um, if, you're, if you're not a programmer in the audience. Basically, that's just pulling data from a source on the web. And there are two types of data that you can pull from Fitbit, or I should say two levels of access for that data. The first one is, is basically a, a standard. If you have a Fitbit and you sign up for an API key, you can pull uh, data on a daily basis. But that's not really sufficient for us if we want to see when our team works and plays. So if you apply for a free partner API key, you can go and pull intraday data uh, based on either minute-by-minute uh, -minute increments or 15-minute increments. So we applied for the partner API key, and, and here's where an idea was born. We thought if we could get access to the team's data and see their steps, especially broken down by the hour and the minute, we could start visualizing when our team is active. And we also realized at the same time that we have access to a wealth of activity just sitting free right in front of us with GitHub. Now, if you're a programmer, you already know what GitHub is. If you're not a programmer, I'll tell you briefly, GitHub is a place to store uh, source code, and it's a version control repository. Uh, next slide, please, Yasmina. So we used Fitbit to track our health. We used GitHub to track our productivity. And then we said, hey, let's mash it up. Next slide, please. The tools that we use for this project, we use RStudio, which is a free R IDE. Of course, we use R, which is a statistics and charting program. We use several packages for R. We use ggplot2, Lattice, and gplot. These are all basically charting libraries. We needed to get access to the Fitbit API. We needed access to GitHub. And we also used Ruby on Rails. We'll talk about each of these tools in turn. Next slide, please. So why did we use Rails? Well, we're a Ruby on Rails shop. That's, that's primarily what we program in. And so it was a no-brainer for us to pick up from there. Now, we, we love Rails for a few reasons. It's free. Um, free is in beer. It's easy to pick up, uh, Rails is. Uh, and I have a typo in there. It says compared to other stats packages. It should say compared to other programming languages. It's opinionated. So we value convention over configuration. And what that means is that every engineer at Intridia, and actually most of the engineers at our competitors as well, they work the same way. They don't spend a lot of time on setting up configuration. There is a Rails way of doing things, and uh, it makes for very high developer productivity. Next slide, please. So uh, basically the three steps that we took uh, were to query the data in an API, to get access to the data, I should say, to pull the data, and to clean it up. And in those first two steps, we used Rails. And then for uh, charting it, we used R. Now, um, we wanted to uh, pull the charts in relatively real time. So when we do our charting, we typically limit it to the past three months of active projects. If you run a team that uh, uses GitHub, you'll know that the data can get very big very quickly. There are a lot of commits, and we have, you know, I, I guess a few hundred repos, and each repo can have thousands of commits. So typically, we look at the data three months at a time, and we're going to talk about some strategies in a minute to uh, limit some of that data so that it's, it's manageable. Next slide, please. So the steps that we took to pull the data is we wrote a rake task. Uh, rake is basically a way of committing tasks over and over again that uh, you want to just hand off to the program and, and walk away from. They're often data gathering tasks or configuration tasks, and uh, they're used in Ruby on Rails. We also uh, use the gem called FitGem and, and a lot of helper applications to pull the data. Uh, we pull the data into uh, an API uh, payload using the Rails console. 
We store it in per person folders to make it easy to filter. Uh, we give each day its own file, and then we save it to S3 for portability. Now I'll talk about a few of these steps in a moment, but that's at a high level, that's how we grab the data from Fitbit. Um, there are three required parameters that we're going to look at. And next slide, please. The first thing that we have to do is uh, authenticate. Now, you could do this in R. If, if you don't know Rails, if you don't want to pick up Rails, you could do all of this in R. It's just that we're a Rails shop and we find it easier. There is a wonderful OAuth library in R. Uh, but one of the disadvantages is that uh, when you authenticate in R, you get sent into the browser. You have to also paste the code into Fitbit. It's a lot of rigmarole. Um, we stuck with Rails because we are the authors of the open source library called OmniAuth uh, that makes it very easy to hide a lot of the complexity. Uh, so it's really a simple two-step process. And of course, these are snippets of code. Some of this is pseudocode. You'll have access to a full code library soon. Uh, but in pseudocode, basically all we do is authenticate. We create a new user instance, and we authenticate, user.auth. The next thing we do is we grab an intraday time series. And again, there are always three parameters that you have to use when querying Fitbit data. There's the resource type, and that could be either uh, steps or swimming or any sort of activity. You can track almost any arbitrary activity in Fitbit. Now what we decided as a team was we wanted to compare apples to apples. We do have, for example, a couple Intridians who are swimmers or who are cyclists, but um, that doesn't really map well to walking and to steps. So uh, for, to keep things simple, we purely look at steps. If you uh, have more sophistication in your organization and want to compare, say, apples to oranges to look across uh, you know, different types of activity, then you would want to handle this a little bit differently. But all we're pulling is steps for that first parameter. Secondly, we um, specify the date. Now, the Fitbit API is fantastic, but it is a little bit quirky. Most APIs, if you're accustomed to working with them, are going to allow uh, to query by a date range. Fitbit, for better or worse, just gives you a particular date. Um, in this instance, I'm cheating a little bit. I know that several Intridians had a good day on uh, August 2nd of this year, so we're querying by that specific day so we, so we don't return zero data. And then the detail level, I specified 15-minute increments. When you have access to the intraday data in the Fitbit API, you can specify, you always have to specify the detail level, but you can specify either 15 minutes or one minute. Now, uh, as a services organization, we really only care about hourly increments of time. And so that, uh, since we're going to have to roll up the data to the hourly level anyway, it's just easier and it's um, a slightly smaller file. If you let Fitbit do the work of rolling up the minute level data into 15 minute increments, and then you roll it up from there. So again, those are the three parameters, the resource type, the date, and the detail level. Now what we get back from that when we query the API is a whole mess of JSON. And uh, I didn't paste it into this talk because it's, it's, it's very lengthy, it's very verbose, but JSON basically is just a JavaScript notation that is lighter weight than XML. And uh, it's uh, lightly structured data. And if you're a programmer and you're used to pulling data from APIs, it used to be that you'd see a lot of XML. These days, so many APIs are uh, sending back JSON that virtually every scripting language has a really nice JSON library. It's very easy to work with JSON and Rails. Uh, again, if you really want to do this in R and you don't want to go into the Rails world, there's uh, JSON IO that works very nicely in R and is very well documented. But either way, you're going to get back a lot of JSON da data, and then you're going to have to do something with it. Next slide, please, Yasmina. Now, this is a little bit different. If you've been programming for a while, um, one way to manage this is to just dump all of your data into a database and then run SQL queries. Uh, we, we found that it was easier and a little bit more flexible to actually take the JSON that comes back and move it into the file system. Uh, remember that what we're doing is we're looking at a relatively small set of data in the scheme of things. We are about 31 people at Intridia. We have uh, only about a year's worth of data for the Fitbit. We got it last November. Um, if you're looking at a production database for a website, you might have a different consideration. But for an organization with our size and our amount of data, we found that putting it into a file structure, it just makes more sense. 
Um, and then what you do is you simply query the files that you're interested in querying, and you're working with a smaller set of data. For us running on local machines, it can, be, uh, it can mean better performance. So what we do is we take the JSON that we get back from Fitbit, and we put it into a, a very simple file structure. Uh, we create a, a directory on a user-by-user -user basis because we'd like to be able to query the data in two ways. We'd like to be able to look for an individual user, and I'm going to show you a couple examples from uh, one of our engineers named Andy who lives and works in China. Um, and then we also like to be able to roll up users as an aggregate. So we simply loop through the JSON, uh, and we take the current user's name, and we look to see if the directory exists, and if it doesn't, we make it. And if it does, then we go ahead and put on a date-by-date -date basis uh, new files into that directory. Next slide, please, Yasmina. You see here our directory structure. It's very, it's very simple. It's very flat. Uh, we just have a folder called Fitbit. And again, this is really meant for somebody running a, a laptop. I'm running all of this off a of MacBook Air. Uh, you might have a different structure if you have thousands and thousands and thousands of files. And if you have a huge organization, you're going to need something a little bit more complex. But for us, for a team of 31, uh, it's a very flat directory structure called Fitbit. And then we name it with the person's first name and the date. And it allows us to grab really only the information we need. Next slide, please, Yasmina. Let's look at what we dump into each one of these files. It's incredibly simple. It's simply a, a timestamp based, again, on the 15-minute increments where 0, 0 is equal to midnight, and a value. Now, on this screen, since um, uh, thankfully Andy was sleeping at midnight, there are no values adjacent to any of the visible timestamps. But once you see activity later in the day, you'll see a value, and that's simply the number of steps. Now, uh, that's it for the moment for pulling data from Fitbit. Let's shift over to pulling data from GitHub. Again, if you have uh, an engineering team, the odds are, are overwhelming that you have access to a huge wealth of data. We wrote a rake task to uh, get the data from GitHub. When we started doing this, we started using the GitHub API, and we hit our first snag right away. GitHub has a, a really wonderful and well-documented API, but again, like we said earlier, your repos can have thousands of commits. And Intridia has been around since 2007. If you have an organization that's even older than ours, you're going to have uh, tons and tons and tons and tons of data, and the pagination can get a little bit hairy. What we did is we, we tried first to use the API and the pagination. It was extremely inefficient. So we actually uh, ended up just going with um, git clone. We cloned down the repo uh, to limit the data set we did uh, want to query only repos that had had activities in the last three months. Uh, since the Fitbit is relatively new to our organization, again, we've only had it for about a year, we didn't want to go back and look from the very beginning of history at Intridia. That's just more data than we need. So we queried uh, repos that are, um, have activity in the last three months, and then we simply cloned them. And we wrote a script to take that information and dump it into a MongoDB. Next slide, please. All we did was we basically ran git log, and uh, we only care about a couple things, and I'll show you the output on the next slide, please, Yasmina. In the git log, you get information like the owner, the repo name, you get a hash, which we disregard, you get an author, an email, and a date. Now, since we are a fairly small organization, it's very easy for us to match up an author in GitHub to uh, the user in the Fitbit API. Um, and really, when we query this, all we care about is the author and the date. Uh, when we query it, we basically roll up uh, a count of the number of commits per date and per hourly increment. Next slide, please. So these are the questions that we started to ask. Once we had pulled all the data, we wanted to ask, when are people pushing code? And are we really all that distributed? You know, one of the great things about Intridia, again, we all work from home. But we're also all over the world. We have people in uh, most of the time zones of the United States. We have uh, a natural language processing specialist uh, who lives in Russia. We have an engineer in Italy. We have a team in China. And so we wanted to see, you know, we, we, we like to tell our clients that they get a lot of value because we're a distributed team. But we wanted to see if that was true. 
we wanted to look at the best time to pair, and we just wanted to ask, do we work differently than uh, organizations that aren't distributed? So um, once we had pulled all the data, uh, it was time to move into R and to start cleaning up the data. So next slide, please. And this should be the why use R slide, Yasmina. Um, again, we are handier at um, wrangling data from APIs in Rails. That's simply an organizational strength and a comfort level. Everything that I just listed in Rails, you could also do in R if that's your preference. But once we actually have the data in the file system, we wanted to use R to clean it up and to visualize it. So why use R? Well, one of the same reasons that we love Rails, it's free. It's also easy compared to other stats packages. If you've ever used any other stats package, um, they can be overwhelming. Uh, they can be very difficult to pick up with a steep learning curve. And one of the other reasons we love R is that if you know already how to do a server-side scripting language, whether it's Ruby, whether it's Python, uh, actually if you know JavaScript in the client, R is very easy to pick up. And it's, it's intended to be easy to learn. It's got a huge community with a lot of libraries, and it's robust with strong visualization libraries. Next slide, please. So let's look at, first of all, the questions we asked of the Fitbit. Do people use their Fitbit? When do they use it? How do they use it? What does a typical day look like? And then what about the team as a whole? Now, we wrote uh, a lot of helper functions to allow us to very easily query this data. And we'll make those available shortly in an open source library. But on the next slide, you can see uh, just a very basic um, Fitbit file list. Now, here's where we get started. We have uh, a get Fitbit file list function to grab all those files that we looked at on the server earlier and just ensure that um, we can get a handle on them. So we grab all the files and we loop through them. And next slide, please. Here we should see the bar plot. Yes, Mina, if you can just confirm we're on the bar plot screen. We are. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So you can see, again, we're back to uh, the old Fitbit data where you simply have a timestamp and then a step value associated with that time. And we're just going to do a very simple bar plot. Now, this is very ugly. It's also not really informationally dense. But this is just to simply make sure that we're actually grabbing the data properly and that we can query it. And you see we can. Even though that doesn't mean anything, this is just a simple test to show that we can query the data. Next slide is chart steps. This is a helper function that we wrote to do, as it says, just to chart the steps and see when are people active. Now, we said earlier we're going to use uh, Andy, who is one of our engineers in China, as an example. And you see right away uh, with this convenience method, chart steps, we specify the name of the engineer. And you see right away we can get some very useful information. Now, you know, maybe none of this is surprising, but it still shows a, a very basic day, a very basic day in the life of an engineer. We see right away Andy kind of gets up at 6 a.m. Now, this is local to his time in China, um, gets breakfast, and uh, maybe he goes for a brief walk after breakfast. He does some walking around noon at lunch, but we notice that you know, relative to some of the other bars, uh, noon is simply getting up out of his chair and rolling into the kitchen. And he saves the evening hours for his exercise. We see this pattern over and over again, that people are most active with exercise in the evening, and they get up and they kind of move around at lunchtime. Next slide, please. So then we asked, what about the entire team? And if you don't pass the parameter to our chart steps helper function, you get the aggregate team. Now, we did localize this data to their particular time zone. There's a reason for that. There are two different ways to look at this data. One is if you localize it to the time zone, you see when a developer is actually working on his own time. But if you don't want to localize it to the time zone, you can sort of see hey, are we telling our clients an accurate story when we say that there's always an intrusion in the world somewhere who's working? And we'll look at that data that's not localized in just a moment. But you see that our engineers and our designers tend to follow remarkably similar patterns. In their local time zone, they all like to get up about the same time. They all take lunch around noon. Uh, I expected particularly that engineers would time shift their lunch a little bit into the afternoons because they don't work that heavily in the morning, but that actually tends not to be the case. 
and they all take a break in the evening and go out and get their exercise. So time and time again, this is basically the aggregate view of our entire team localized, and they follow a remarkably similar pattern. Next slide, please. So we started looking um, at GitHub, and we wrote a helper function called chart commits, just as we had a chart steps function for Fitbit. We wrote a helper function chart commits for GitHub, and we wanted to look at when people actually push code. And this is also in the user's local time, and we find uh, you know, a slightly different pattern. Of course, it, it, it shouldn't be surprising that people are a little bit less productive around lunchtime. One of the things that we had kind of a good laugh at is um, to the extent that our team is eating maybe too many carbs, there is a sleepy valley in the afternoon, whereas they only have lunch at noon, they have lower productivity for an hour or two after that. So maybe that's a, a, a post-carb siesta. Um, but uh, they also really pick up in the evening hours pushing their commits, and this is all on local time. We also wanted to know really in universal time, are we telling our clients the truth when we say that we add value around the clock? So next slide, please, Yasmina. If we pass a, the, a parameter called false to chart commits, it doesn't localize the time. And we see that, yes, we actually really are working around the clock in Intridia. And that's pretty exciting, when you, particularly when you begin to think about pairing and you begin to think about when are we posting commits and when can we post hot fixes. Let's say if a client discovers a bug late in the day, um, normally in a lot of teams, you would actually have to ask somebody, well, are you going to stay late to fix that bug, or uh, are you going to tell the client that it's going to get fixed tomorrow? If you have a distributed team that works around the world, a lot of the times you fix that bug on your, uh, your evening cycle, and it gets done the very next day. So we see that we do tend to push code uh, all around the day at Intridia. So uh, next slide, please. What were some of the things that we learned? from having a distributed team. We saw that the US team time shifts a little bit more than the Eastern team. The Eastern team tends to work slightly more classic area hours. And so that tells us one thing, the optimal time to pair uh, tends to be around, say, 7 to 10 p.m. in the evenings. Now, one of the first things I learned when I joined Intridia as a manager, I, I saw our programmers working uh, at 10 p.m. And I kept saying, uh, you know, uh, guys, girls, please uh, don't burn yourself out. I don't want you to work death march hours. And somebody finally had to take me aside and say, no, nobody's working death march hours. They're simply time shifting. That's just when the engineers tend to like to work. And that works really well having a distributed team because we can pair program in the evenings when there's almost always somebody working. Um, we do also see that uh, the Eastern team tends to break up their exercise between mid-morning and early evening. And that told us to get our stand-ups out of the way as, as soon as they get online so they can get out and get their exercise. Uh, next slide, please, Yasmina. One of the really exciting things that we learned culturally is that virtually everyone participates in using the Fitbit. Um, 30 out of 31 Intridians use it, and we were really excited by that. We did use opt-out. We might have cheated just a little bit. Uh, so when we sent out uh, the request to Intridians, we did say, you will be getting a Fitbit unless you tell us that you don't want one. But uh, it did turn out that everybody picked one up. Now, there is an exception to that participation. You really have to be careful with the amount of data that you track with, on your team. And you also have to be careful with your messaging. Only a minority of our team uh, chooses to expose their data uh, via the intraday API. And let's remember what we can tell with that data. We can tell when they're getting up and moving about, when they're walking a certain number of steps. And while we could sort of infer that data from uh, the GitHub data, the GitHub data is really owned by Intridia. The Fitbit data is very personal to our engineers and to our designers. So we do ask our, their permission to access it. Slightly less than half give us that permission. We have um, basically a form that they fill out that uh, exposes their data programmatically and um, you know, a little bit less than half participation rate. Um, and uh, next slide, please. We also see often that the fittest Intridians do tend to be the most productive Intridians. Um, I can't say that we have a lot of information on uh, whether that's causation or correlation, particularly since we've only had the Fitbits a little bit less than a year, and we just started this exercise over the summer. We'll look at that over time uh, to see, basically, does improved fitness 
actually just correlate with being more productive or does it drive productivity? A very important question. We also see that our overall level of fitness has increased drastically. Um, you saw the before and after picture of me, and I, I have several other success stories of a similar nature to tell about other Intridians. Just this past weekend, we fielded um, three teams at the, the Baltimore Marathon Relay, relay teams uh, that we ran this weekend. So we had 12 Intridians participate. And we see that um, as the fitness level increases, this drives more engagement in our virtual water cooler. Now remember, with a distributed team, you really have to think about uh, ensuring people get engaged with each other and they have more camaraderie. You know, it's particularly we see that many introverts, uh, sorry, many engineers, myself included, are introverts and can, you know, sit in a room and swing code all day long and not get around, not move about, and not interact with other people. And we want to make sure that people are interacting. We use a chat software called HipChat for our virtual water cooler. But no matter what your organization is using, as people get more fit, they have something to talk about other than work. And we find that they hang out in the water cooler and talk about fitness. And it's very, um, it, it fosters a lot of camaraderie. And one of the things I would love to do, we have not yet queried a uh, hip chat activity, both for the kinds of information that people talk about in the public room and also um, when they're chatting. But that's a next step for us. I think it'd be a lot of fun to tie that in with both the GitHub data and the Fitbit data. Next slide, please. So what's next? More APIs. Again, uh, we would love to pull uh, hip chat data. And even though that's not exposed as an API, uh, within the interface, you can do a bulk export. One of the really important things to note, if you do look at hip chat data, is that it only exports data from public rooms, meaning that a private conversation that an engineer has with another engineer is not exposed to that export. And, and I keep coming back to the importance of really protecting your engineer's privacy. These can be sort of invasive queries that if they don't believe in doing this, they're, they're not going to appreciate tracking this kind of information. Uh, we also want to look at more data over a longer period of time. Uh, and particularly uh, as we have uh, more data, we just started last November. We're approaching our first year of data. We, we'd really like to track it uh, both uh, daily uh, monthly and quarterly. Uh, we think that it would be really fun to pull together an interactive web dashboard and expose some of these queries on the Your Time platform, yourtime.intridia.com that we showed you at the very beginning, which is open source, by the way. And then we will be open sourcing both uh, the Rails code and the R code. We've already got a package called Waggle that's on uh, GitHub. It's not quite ready for prime time. We do have private data in there. The biggest task before we open source it is to clean up that private data and give you guys a sample set that you can query. But um, if you would like to help us test those packages before we open source it, please do contact me. Please do keep in touch. On Twitter, my handle is since 1968, and uh, we're also in Tridia on Twitter. So please do reach out to me if you'd like to help us test. And Yasmina, that is my presentation. Thank you so much to everyone for attending, and I'm really happy to take some questions. Excellent presentation, Mark. Really fascinating information there. And we do have several questions that have come in. So folks, we are at Q&A now. If you have a question for Mark and what he's been talking to you about and showing you, please open your group chat, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. All righty, Amy would like to know, is a JSON being saved to a file structure on the web server? Amy, that's a great question. Um, we, we don't have any of this information exposed to a web server yet you know, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we, we, we don't need to yet. Um, this is a relatively small amount of information. But secondly, I, I didn't want to have to give a lot of thought to security. Let's remember that um, this is very personal information. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what you could discover about an engineer that they wouldn't like you to know by, by knowing when they take the steps and how many steps they take. But we're already sensitive to exposing our engineers' information. So this is just pulled down locally. Um, once we do build it out on the web platform, then yes, it, uh, JSON would get saved on the server in the flat file structure. And we would have to have a really um, hard think about how we're going to keep that information secure. That's a great question. Thank you. Next question here from Paul Skinner. He says, I'm interested in merging location and heart rate data from a Garmin GPS device and merging that with simultaneous Fitbit data from a short one-hour running session. 
what tools do you recommend to merge the two devices' data? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I haven't looked at the format, Paul, um, that comes out of Garmin, but you know, what, what we have talked about today is, is essentially um, a set of best practices for querying an API in Rails, for grabbing that data in Rails, for saving it locally, and, and what we call munging the data in Rails, and then, uh, and then visualizing it in R. So you know, I, I would say that um, any of the, the Rails tools that we looked at should apply, and the practices that we looked at for pulling the data that work for Fitbit and GitHub should also apply to Garmin. And I will make a note to myself to go um, and Google and see what sort of API Garmin has. But it, it should be relatively straightforward. One of the considerations that, that you might want to think about right off the top of my head is let's remember we are querying uh, the Fitbit data in 15-minute increments. That might be too long of a time span for it to be useful to you if you're looking at heart rate data. You might want to be looking at heart rate data minute by minute. So uh, way back at the beginning of the presentation, when we, when we query the Fitbit data in the 15-minute increments, you might want to change that parameter and query it minute by minute and have a, a much richer data set coming from Fitbit so that you can uh, tie it minute by minute uh, to Garmin, assuming that Garmin provides the information at the same increment. Next question. Thank you. Next question is from Christian. Why are the commit times meaningful? Do users commit their data manually or automatically? Yeah, Christian, that's a great question. And, and I, I, I know right away that Christian is an engineer for asking that question. So, you know, using commits to show productivity is notoriously problematic. Um, it is, it's the beginning of a conversation, and it's not um, dispositive in any way. Uh, you can have an engineer, for example, um, kind of gain productivity by constantly committing. Uh, I had one of my best senior engineers who was a very lazy committer and um, only made uh, you know, kind of one commit per day. And, and I, I, myself, I don't like that practice. I think you should be committing um, on a very granular basis. But we do find that um, the commits, to answer your question, Christian, they are manual. They're not automatic. And so you can skew the results uh, just by having different programming styles. Um, now, what I will say is this. We really do try to work the same way uh, from uh, Intridian to Intridian. Uh, we really do try to adhere to the same programming methodology. And, and the reason for that is, you know, people are remote. They're, they're in different locations. And if they're not working the same way, it can make for, um, you know, for very, very, confusing, uh, sorry, very confusing guidance that we give our engineers and very confusing results. So, you know, we do find over time that people do tend to commit at roughly the same pace. But um, yeah, again, it's a great question, and you have to realize there are very big caveats when you're looking purely at number of commits to measure productivity. Thanks for that question. Next one. Great. Um, let's see here. Reynaldo would like to know, do the teams use Scrum or Kanban? Yeah, that's a great question. Classically, we are a Scrum shop. Um, we have been experimenting, Reynaldo, with Kanban, and, and we love it. Um, we find that um, there's a we, – we use the um, – the, uh, basically the Atlassian suite um, of you know, Confluence. Uh, we use Jira for the bug tracking. I think Atlassian not so long ago acquired HipChat, which was lucky for us because we use HipChat anyway. So we use all the Atlassian uh, suite for our interacting, and we really like the Kanban view. Um, and we found, interestingly enough, that it was the designers and not the engineers who first kind of picked up the Kanban methodology, and that is slowly spreading throughout our organization. I won't, so, I won't say that we're um, all the way there yet. We are traditionally Scrum, but, but, but Kanban, I love it myself, and, um, and the, the tools that we use lend themselves to working that way. Next question. Great. Arthur has um, a two-part question. He'd like to know if the graphs you were showing can be part of a web page, and does all of this run on Windows 7 Pro OS? Uh, that's a great question. So, so right now, um, the graphs in, in R, yeah, so let me think. Uh, in R, basically you output to a console. So the screenshots that I was showing, Arthur, um, are, are output to a console, and then you can export to a PDF or PNG. There are a lot of extensions to R that let you run R on the server and serve it up to a web page. Um, I have some reservations about them. R is really classically 
uh, the kind of thing that you run on your desktop uh, and, and output on the desktop. Of course, you can run R in the server, and there's all sorts of variants of um, you know, uh, distributed R where you run parallel tasks. But, but really, R is kind of about one statistician or one economist or one engineer sitting down and hacking away at some data on his or her desktop. Um, so if you wanted to show it on the web, you could either use one of the extensions to R that do uh, allow you to serve these images up on the web. And, and there are many. And in fact, I think there might even be a ggplot uh, JavaScript library that mimics the functions of, uh, of ggplot. Uh, so you could look into that. Or if you really want to think about making it interactive, you would want to start looking at um, one of the web-friendly technologies for visualization. We love something called d3.js. Uh, that's D like Delta 3.js, which is a fantastic, fantastic visualization platform. We've used it on projects like um, uh, scriptureanalytics.org. We used it for the Pew Forum. And so if you really want to get into uh, you know, sorting that data and visualizing it uh, in real time on the web, you probably want to look at a JavaScript tool. Um, the second part of your question, can you tell me, uh, Yasmina, win Windows 7, which, which variation? Windows 7 Pro OS. Great. So um, I believe that R runs on Windows just fine. Uh, we are an open source shop, and as, as open source engineers, we tend to gravitate uh, toward the Mac. Uh, not, not that the Mac or, uh, or OS X is actually open source, but open source technologies tend to run really well on the Mac. Secondarily, if we don't use Macs, we, do, we tend to use Linux machines. Um, I will say that in the first half of my presentation, I focused on Ruby on Rails. And Ruby on Rails is really not your best choice if you're going to be on Windows. Um, R does work just fine on Windows. And so what you would want to do is you would want to look at some of the methodologies we talked about in Rails. And instead of fighting Rails on Windows, I would just recommend uh, querying all of your data in R and visualizing the data in R if you really want to do this on Windows. I think that would work just fine to stick purely in R. Next question. Excellent. A couple more questions here. Um, I'm Apologize, I'm not saying your name correct. Woj Sich would like to know, has the team ever met in person in one place? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we definitely find, uh, we, we have to do that for our engineers to be happy. We have to get together. And we just had a retreat this uh, past July in the Hamptons where we got the entire team under one roof. We, we had a blast. We rented this, um, this big 100-year-old mansion, and we we had cookouts, and everybody went to the beach together and, and just had a fantastic time. The retreat before that was on the Maryland shore. And um, we just find that we, just, we have to do that for camaraderie. Um, we have to do it so that we're all on the same page with um, you know, uh, the vision for the company. Because if you're off working by yourself every day, you might be doing good work as an individual, but it doesn't really mean that you're participating as a team. Now, secondarily to that, we also make sure that we have smaller get-togethers. So for example, um, we just uh, sponsored a conference called The Next Web, and we ensured that a lot of the Intridians who were close to New York City got together when we sponsored that conference and had a lot of good face time. We also do things that are not at all work-related. So we just went, um, like I said, to the Baltimore Marathon, and we put up uh, three relay teams, and we all got together for that. Uh, so even uh, for the Baltimore Marathon, that was only 12 Intridians. You know, it was enough that people felt um, some real camaraderie. With a distributed team, you have to be mindful of that all the time. So great question. All righty, and just a couple more questions here as we wrap up the event. Um, Elmer would like to know, what kind of testing help are you looking for, or where can you find information about that? Yeah, thanks, Elmer. Um, well, you know, I would just like to have a, a couple uh, types of help. I would like somebody to, to, you know, basically throw their own data against the scripts that we've written and just make sure it works. Um, maybe you have a, a larger data set than what we're using. I would like to know, um, you know what happens when you point it toward a larger data set. I'd also like to know um, really you know, how flexible are the tools. I mean, for example, uh, our next step is to work on HipChat. And I haven't really tested to see some of these helper methods, how easily they can be repurposed to a slightly different format. So uh, that's the kind of testing I would love. And I would also just love to see um, if anybody wants to see you know, the results they get, and then let's have a great conversation, whether it's uh, if your data is sensitive, let's have a private conversation. If you feel comfortable, let's have a conversation on our blog or on your blog about, hey, you know, we've got this remote team. Here's how we work. Here are some of the things that we learned, and, and here are some of the things you might want to try in your organization. So um, the best way to help us test is just uh, to tweet me 
Uh, again, I'm, at, I'm since 1968 on Twitter, and uh, you can reach me that way, and we'll give you access to the repo. Perfect. And, folks, we do have the slide on the screen still. You can see it there. It's got um, Mark's contact information, so please feel free to take advantage of that. All righty, Mark, we'll take our final question from Paul, who asks, do any of your Intridians use a standing desk in their home office and therefore average more steps per day than a standard desk and chair? Golly, Paul, you know, I've never thought to ask that. I love that question, and I'm going to make a note to ask Intridians. Now, I know anecdotally we, <laughs> we used to have an engineer named Paul uh, who liked to have a walking desk. So uh, he was uh, long before we ever got the Fitbit, and I would have loved to see his, his step count would have been crazy high. He's since moved on. I know that a couple of Intridians do use standing desks, but I've never thought to compare uh, the Intridians who use standing desks to see how uh, their, their steps correlate. I, I love that question, and I will definitely look at that. Thank you so much. Excellent. Oh, and it looks like we have just one more question here from Bridget who would like to know, Mark, is there a simple way to package this to act as an employee wellness program for corporations? Yeah, Bridget, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I think in terms of getting started easily, uh, the, the code itself is pretty, you know, borderline trivial, honestly. It's not that hard. I mean, we, I, I did obscure some of the complexity with the helper methods that I talked about today. So, in, you know, if you've got a coder in your corporation, you're going to be able to run this code. What I would guess is that um, larger corporations will probably have to have a, a hard think with their HR department in terms of employee participation, in terms of employee privacy. You know, we're, we're small and we're informal, and we can just ask people, hey, are you comfortable or are you not comfortable? I expect that probably some of the cultural hurdles in a big corporation would be um, you know, more challenging to overcome than the actual coding hurdles, which are, which are pretty straightforward. But that's a great question. And if you'd like to tweet me, um, I, I, would, I would love to chat more about that. Excellent. And again, folks, we do have Mark's contact information there on the screen for you. With that, Mark, we are going to say a very big thank you to you, sir, for spending time with us today and for presenting a really outstanding webcast for us all today. Thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, for showing up and for the opportunity to talk about uh, FIT and distributed teams. I had a lot of fun. Thanks, y'all. Excellent. Folks that attended our event today, thank you so much for spending time with us. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd also like to let you know that we did push out a little code to you all as a thank you for attending our event today. So if you didn't open your group chat, please do a little code in there to save you some money on the O'Reilly store. You can get um, some great books on R and JSON and all kinds of JavaScript data visualization, things that Mark was talking about today that can really help you with your day-to-day. -day. So please do take advantage of that. Again, we'll say a big thank you to you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.